I want to welcome everybody to our webinar today. My name is Dave Blake. I'm the founder and CEO of Client Success. So thrilled to be here with you, with all of our friends who join us week after week for these, uh, these webinars. And very excited uh, for this session today where we have Ro uh, Roger Mendez, Global Leader, Leader of Strategic Programs at Cisco, who's going to be talking to us today about deploying customer operations programs to power scale. Roger, how you doing? I'm doing fantastic, Dave. How you doing? Doing well. Now, I think we're both here in Utah, right? Correct. Yeah. Yep. Here in Silicon Slopes. Today's a beautiful fall day, kind of crisp and cold, but uh, but it's good to be together again. Now, this uh, this presentation that you're sharing today is it comes from your experience and thought leadership, but it's one that you also presented at our, our recent CS100 Summit. Is that that's that's correct, right? Correct. Yeah. Mm hmm. All right, and this was a popular session for CS100 Summit, so we thought we'd have uh, Roger come and and share it with the, our broader community, global community. So glad to have you here today, uh, Roger. Um, maybe tell us a little bit about yourself and and what you uh, a little bit about what you're going to share with us today. Yeah, yeah, really excited to be on this um, phone call, Dave, and really excited to talk a little bit more about deploying customer success operations and programs to power scale. So. I feel like in the industry today, customer success operations is very similar to what customer success was 10 years ago, where every company knows that they need a specific presence, but they're still trying to fully define what that looks like. And so hoping to talk a little bit about what learnings you can take to your organization after this session. That's great. That's great. Well, I'm going to jump off. I'm going to run. I'm going to man the chat and the q and I'm going to jump in a little bit uh, when, when they have questions, but really looking forward to the session. Yeah, likewise. And I'll go ahead and start sharing my screen. Um, first and foremost, really grateful for the opportunity team to talk a little bit about customer success and the operations aspect. Um, I'm going to go ahead and play from my current slide. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, I was chatting with Dave a little bit beforehand and um, really excited about the questions and comments that will be coming through. So Feel free to um, you know, ask any questions or any comments or any things that we can talk about specifically, really looking forward to that aspect as well. So again, uh, to introduce myself, my name is Roger Mendez. I've been at Cisco for almost eight years. I was actually part of the first customer success team at Cisco. And so that's actually surprising when I tell people that just because they think of Cisco as a technology you know, presence when it comes to the industry and networking and security, but they're actually pretty new to customer success. So I was actually part of the first Salt Lake City team. We had our West Coast presence for customer success. And our first model of customer success was more of a land adopt, expand, renew motion. So I was actually part of our sales side of the organization. And about a year and a half into the, the role, we transitioned to a more of a customer experience organization where we combined our services, our customer success support team, and also our customer success team in general. And so we transitioned more from that land adopt, expand, renew motion to more of a racetrack methodology where we were looking at customers holistically, looking at how do we cover all different products and portfolios for our customers? How do we measure success along this journey with us? So I actually started in the field. I worked with some of our top enterprise customers to identify what was relevant to them. What was customer success all about for them? Um, we hear this term in the industry over the last few years where we're going more to a solution-based approach when it comes to customer success. So working with some of our customers in solutions and identifying how that works. And so after doing that for about a couple of years, I moved into our customer success operations team. So I so started focusing more on being more of a consultative approach for Cisco, looking at how do we start scaling this from an operational lens. And I've been doing that over the last year and a half, specifically for our strategic programs. And I'm really excited to talk a little bit more about that. Um, I just wanted to start a little bit here with an about me slide. I know I talked to you a little bit about my Cisco journey. You can see here on the top slide, um, that was my first conference at Cisco working with our customer success team. Um, but this is just a little bit about me. As Dave mentioned, I actually grew up in the San Jose area. I grew up about five minutes from the Cisco office. Um, so I'm a Bay Area native, but I did spend some time going to school in Utah um, and being able to uh, start studying kind of this customer success practice when I started going to school and working at it as it was a new term in the industry as I started along my journey as well. Last thing I'll just call out from this slide, um, one person that really motivates me here is my mom. She's on the bottom of the slide. 
Um, she actually was an international exchange student here in the U.S. She went to school in California. Um, when she had me, she was actually working at the Macy's department store. And I actually love the story. I'll share it really quickly. Um, but when she was going to school and working at Macy's and selling perfume, she knew that she needed to do something greater. And so she actually went to a job fair. She sent 100 applications to jobs. Um, one of the callbacks that she got was from Hewlett Packard. And they wanted her to interview for a role there. And she ended up getting the job. My mom is actually from South America. So she speaks fluent Spanish and Portuguese. Um, but after her first day in the job, she talked to my dad. She was like, I don't know if I can do this tech thing. It's really hard. It's challenging. I think I'm going to quit. And my dad was like, no, you have to do it. Like they can, they can't really teach somebody the skills when it comes to technology. Well, they can teach somebody the skills in technology. They just can't teach somebody how to speak Spanish and Portuguese and so after that first day, she had at Hewlett Packard 12 days, uh, 12 years later, she ended up leading all of LATAM for Hewlett Packard in sales. And so that's something that really excites me just because I share that with you, because I think when it comes to customer success operations, people are still trying to identify what that exactly means. And so you may start an operations practice and say, hey, I need to set up, you know, what we look like from not only tracking our customers progress and perspective, but also how do we move customers towards a frictionless renewal? And you may see some variety with that. You may see some change. So my call to action, similar to what my dad said to my mom is don't quit, keep going. And we'll talk a little bit more about this presentation and what it looks like so far. So when it comes to customer success operations, I think the ability to have a customer success ops teams in customer success is so influential. And I really start with it building the story. And so one of the things that I've really tried to execute at Cisco is not looking at things specifically as good or, or bad. And so the reason why I say that is, especially in customer success ops, you work with so many different key stakeholders. You'll have the business unit, you'll have the VPs of customer success and sales. You'll also have some of the product owners that are actively working on the product. And so when they ask you to run a specific program or motion or start defining customer success ops, you may have people that start looking at things as good or bad. I really don't like to look at it that from that perspective. I always like to ask ourselves, especially in customer success ops, the effectiveness of the motion or program or the actual execution of the program looks like. And so this is the formula that I like to start off with. It's what does effectiveness, effectiveness mean in the organization? And I break it down by four specific pillars. So you look at your values and goals. So what's specifically the values of customer success and in the ops function as well? Like, for us at Cisco, we want to really make sure that we're moving customers towards a frictionless renewal. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in the presentation of what that looks like. The second one is the current facts. What are the facts of the organization? Do you currently have a total addressable market where you can see some specific telemetry or insights on your customers, but also how does the organization run when it comes to customer success? How do you connect with some of the other parts of the organization? The third one is the rules of the organization. And I think this one's a big one when it comes to actually looking at the product or what you're selling. If you're looking for a specific change and you want that to happen the next day, that may not happen, but what can you do to work towards that? So for example, at Cisco, we start collecting our adoption barriers. We look at specific emotions. We look at success priorities. What can we start collecting today? And then the last thing is what has and hasn't worked in the past. I think that's something really important as you start looking at metrics and overall data? How do you start tracking that? How do you start making sure that in the short term, you're working towards some of your organizational goals, but what can you show that you've made progress in the short term as well? So I think that's something that's super important. Now, this slide I really like just because as I've talked to you a little bit about what we're seeing from a customer success operations lens, this is what we're starting to see as a trend for why we need customer success. So you can see that we have the customer reality on the left-hand side where we have some of these major callouts from some of our top customers here at Cisco, but we're starting to see this from an industry perspective as well. So you can see that first and foremost, customers want to accelerate their client digital transformation. You can see also as well is that they really want agility from applications as well. They wanna make sure that they have a multi-suite approach. We see this transition from the cloud. So having multiple offers to the cloud we're looking for subscription economy. So asking customers to do more with less, right? Making sure that they have more operational efficiency. Um, accelerating time to value. So making sure that what they purchase with us, they're seeing value on day one. And also focusing on some of their business outcomes. And this is something that I've really seen when it comes from customer success ops is customers are not necessarily really 
you know, more excited about what they can actually do with the product in regards to how that's really addressing some of their current needs. But they're also trying to identify what they're missing as well. So like we can track from a customer success operations lens on, hey, you're actually doing this with the product. We're seeing that you're using this consumption of licensing. But customers are really getting more excited about, well, Roger, in my demographic, what am I missing? Like, are there other customers in my specific vertical, whether it's healthcare or manufacturing? Like, what are some of their outcomes that I can see that I'm possibly missing out on that I can excel on? And when it comes back to the business reality, like when it comes to customer success ops, one of the biggest call outs that I'll get is, well, Roger, we need to protect the revenue. We want to make sure that the ARR that we have for our company, specifically at what we're doing from a product perspective and portfolio, how do we protect that? And I really like this slide and it was part of my presentation at CS Summit 100, which I'll talk a little bit about. But when you get that call out of protecting the revenue, it's almost asking somebody, I expect you to memorize pi. And this is the equation of pi, which starts with 3.1415. And when you look at these numbers, similar to what we see from a revenue perspective, it's, it can get overwhelming. And just to give you some perspective on this, Cisco had a, about a $52 billion revenue for all of last fiscal year in 2024. And so when you look at that and you look at Cisco's portfolio where we cover 20 different products, it's very similar to looking at protecting the revenue from a pie perspective. We see these numbers, but similar to customer success ops, when I talk to you about building a story, what do these numbers really mean? And so that's what I specifically did at the CS Ops 100 is I invited about 10 individuals on stage with me to say that I wanted to do an exercise on how do we build this story together? So you can see here that we have specific individuals from different segments of customer success. Um, they had started networking obviously at this event, but I don't think they really had prior knowledge of where they were from or you know where they came from from an organizational lens. And so what I did is I wanted each person to represent a part of the story. And so what I was asking them to do is we were gonna tell a story together. And I started with the first person on stage and the first thing that I said is, I want you to start memorizing this part of the story. And so what I said is to the first person is, I want you to remember that there's three people sitting at a table. And I went to the second person and I said, I want you to remember that there's a 14 year old, a 15 year old and a 92 year old at this table. And so you can see that as I went through each one of these people, they were asked to remember part of the story. Now, the nice thing is I wanted to make sure I had a reinforcer as well. So if they were able to memorize their part of the story, I was able to reward them with a Starbucks gift card just to make sure that they had some value out of memorizing the story. Now, what happened was within a matter of, I would say, you know, two to three minutes, everybody remembered their part of the story and they were able to start allocating or building the story that was going off together. And the reason why this was so important, the reason why this activity was so fun is not only did it engage the individuals that were on stage with me, but everybody in the audience was able to remember the story and follow along. Now, the part that I haven't told you quite yet is the story was helping everybody memorize the first 20 numbers of pi. And so the nice thing is when you, we go back to this slide and look at those first 20 numbers, and I'll run through the story really quickly. Basically, what I was telling people on stage was there's three people sitting at a table, a 14-year-old, a 15-year-old, and a 92-year-old. And the 15-year-old's so excited that he can drive 65 miles per hour. But then you have the person that's talking about, you know, the 14 year old is like, well, at least, you know, I know that I can drink three Cokes. And then the 15 year old is like, well, at least I can drink five Cokes. And the 92 year old said, well, I'll take your three Cokes and five Cokes and I'll drink eight Cokes. But he said, let's forget about that. Let's turn on a basketball game. And it was a basketball game where the score was 97 to 93. There was 238 left on the clock. The leading score was number four and the coach's age was 62. And so you can see, I ran that through really quickly, but every part of that story was building up towards the story of memorizing all these 20 numbers of pi. Now, what was so significant about this is how fast it took the audience and also the, the members of the people that were participating with me to memorize those numbers is I wanted to make sure that in customer success ops, you have the ability to dictate the narrative. So instead of looking at it as three people sitting at a table, but what if you changed the story? What if you said, hey, I have three organizations. I have 14 specific CSMs that are going to work on this technology. I have 15 different motions that I want to run. And I want to have a 92% renewal rate. When you start controlling that narrative around protecting the, the specific revenue, 
I think that's where you're going to get the buy-in from key leadership and that they're going to want to start investing in a customer success operations practice. Now, the reason why I call this out, when you look at revenue, similar to what we see on the sales side of an organization, if I'm a sales rep, I look at protecting my pipeline and I start forecasting on how effectively I'm going to close the deals that I have in my pipeline. Well, with similar to customer success and operations, if I start building out a framework and a methodology that I can go back to my senior leadership to say, hey, I feel really confident if a customer sees this much value but gets to this specific stage in their customer success adoption journey with us, they're going to renew at 80 to 95% of the time with us. And we st when we start building that narrative, we start seeing really tremendous value in an investment in customer success operations. Now, similar back to my effectiveness formula, the very first thing is defining what the value looks like. And so that's something that I really tried to execute in customer success when it came to Cisco, is we wanted to make sure that we were aligning our CS ops values specifically to what we wanted to do. And so for us, our mission statement is we accelerate our customer success and profitability growth for Cisco and our partners by delivering the best customer experience in the industry. So the first one is customer obsession. The second one is trusted expertise. The last one is extraordinary together. Now, the reason why it's so important to have values around what's important in customer success ops is because as you are working in this organization, you may be working with sales or renewals or product development. And when they start asking you to do something among, among their specific emotions or programs, you can start asking yourself, well, does this really align to our values and customer success? Is this really focused on our customer obsession? Is this what's doing what's best for the customer? Do we have trusted expertise? Do we have the resources and expertise to make sure that we have resources to have hands-on development or hands-on technical expertise? And then also, how are we building the story together? So that's something that's a really strong call to action is as you start looking at customer success, defining some of those values, not only from a customer perspective on how you measure customer success, but specifically for ops is how are you going to start accelerating an ops function just to make sure that you're moving toward to where you want to go. Now, this is a slide that I really love. I'm a big fan of Marvel and the Avengers, but similar to that photo that I showed you when I started building the story about protecting the revenue, I invited 10 specific individuals when it came to customer success. I said, okay, I need you to retell the story back to me. We were memorizing pie together. But the reason why that was so significant, I aligned everybody in a specific vertical line, is when it comes to customer success, I think as you start talking with some of the key stakeholders, from, especially from an ops perspective, you know, if you ask somebody, well, what's the importance or the hierarchy of somebody actually talking to a customer or working the account? You may get some different discussions, I would say, on the importance of the person reaching out to the account. And the reason why I say that is, you know, you may have somebody say, well, it should be the AM. I would like I would line up the account manager or the account executive first, and then it would be the sales engineer, and then it would be the renewal specialist, and then it would be the tech support specialist, and then it would be customer success. But my thing is, what if we got rid of that hierarchy and knowing that every person that reached out into the account or started working with the customer, that they had a, a really specific role and significance to the importance of the account. And so that's why I try to have this Avengers perspective. That's why we actually call some of our customer success teams Avengers teams, just because we want to make sure that no matter how you line them, them up, similar to this image, whether you change the characters, that it won't delay the customer progress, that anybody that's reaching out to the account has specific objectives that they know from a strategic and a tactical perspective on how to work with the account. So we want to get rid of those specific personas and making sure that every person is a part or accountable for the story that's so important. Now, the, the way you achieve that, I think, and, and Dave mentioned this being from, you know, being able to live in Utah, one of my favorite authors that I follow is Stephen R. Covey, and he wrote this book called The Seven Highly Effective Habits. And one of the things that he talked about in this habits book is the P versus the PC capability. And I think that's what really defines the specific motion of customer success ops. Similar to when I was talking about protecting the revenue and also that Cisco, you know, made about $53 billion in that fiscal year, that's the production. So you can see that's where renewals lives, that's the growth, that's the upsells, but you have to have a balance and that's where the production capability comes in. Now, the reason why Stephen R. Covey came up with this is he gives us an example of a fable with Esau with the golden goose versus the golden egg. 
And so the goose was the capability of producing that golden egg where the farmer came in every day to check on to see, to his surprise, there was a golden egg. But that was the production capability. The goose was able to produce that day over day. But what ended up happening is the farmer saw that he wanted to make sure that he increased that and ended up, you know, reducing his goose and that really it eliminated the golden egg perspective. And so when it comes to a customer success ops perspective, this is what excites me about this role so much is you're almost like a consultant back to the company. So when I look at my function in the organization, I'm a consultant back to Cisco. Yes, they want to protect the production, but we also start have to look at the production capability. And so when I look at the specific role, I start raising my hand to say, hey, I'm going to be an advocate for our customer success teams. I'm going to make sure that I'm starting to look at their perspective on how to make their job a lot easier. So in customer success ops, when we start looking at the production, we can start breaking our customers by their specific total addressable market. So for example, I can look at a customer to say, how much does my customer spend in ARR? What's their customer sentiment with customer success? Do they have any active adoption barriers? Do they have any success priorities? And then I can start building out specific production capability programs for our customer success team to be able to execute upon that. So for example, if I have a customer that has an upcoming renewal in the next six months, they haven't used their product quite yet, they have active adoption barriers, but they have a strong relationship with customer success, we can say, all right, we're going to start building a tactical program and an execution motion for our customer success teams. So we actually give them some direction and help to make sure that we've done all the hard work. We're still protect protecting the production, but we're also having that balance to make sure how do you start executing on some of this production capability? Now, the way that we do that here is it's a very good example of what our customer success approach looks like at Cisco. So I know some of you are aware of some of this racetrack methodology, but we've been starting to really centralize this to look at that the customer here is really the central piece of how we execute our customer success motion. So very similar to a NASCAR racetrack, we have really specific roles and responsibilities that are really measured on the execution of how fast we move our customers along. Now, I've been talking to you a little bit about our customer success motion, but actively, what I've been working on the last year and a half at Cisco is giving customers the visibility to track this methodology with us. So similar to racing a NASCAR racetrack car, we're allowing our customers to get in the driver's seat with us to be able to make sure that depending on how fast they want to go with us, we're going to really accelerate their time to value. And so you can see here that each part of this racetrack, we're defining specific checkpoints along the way just to make sure that we're checking in with our customer, just to make sure how fast they want to go with us, but also how uh, successful and effective this journey is going with us. So you can see that we have on the left hand side, we have our sales component where they're really aligning, selecting, evaluating with our customer's perspective. But when this handoff happens back to customer success, we start seeing that we're really trying to have a strong onboarding, implementation, use. Um, really specific checkpoints along this customer journey. Now, the reason why we do this is we want to make sure that we're getting really proactive on this journey. So we're making sure that instead of a customer getting stuck in stage, we're making sure that we're really following along with the customer's journey to get as fast as they can with us. So this is where we start saying that we want to make sure that customers have a frictionless renewal with us, that they have a seamless adoption journey with us so that when we hand off back to renewals, the customer's seen the value. Now, the nice thing about this is it doesn't have to look like this for your organization. You can get really prescriptive on what you want this to look like. So for example, at Cisco, we team up with some of our operational teams to say, how do we start integrating this and in some of our CSP platforms so that we can actually start measuring where a customer's at? And similar back to that forecasting analogy that I gave you, if I, if I start saying that customers are reaching that use or renew stage, I have a likely greater capability or, um, you know, basically improvement to say that customers are going to renew at 80 to 95% of the time. Now, you may raise your hand to say, well, Roger, how can you really define that a customer specifically there? Well, we start looking at customers sharing telemetry and insights with us, but we start working with some of our teams on the operational side to say, well, what are what is it, what is it going to really define for a customer to specifically reach this life cycle stage or the specific checkpoint? And what do they specifically have to do? Is it license consumption? Is it actively logging in? Is it customer behavior and sentiment? Is it what they're actively doing with the product? So we start looking and calculating to see what is the customer seeing a lot of value out of? So this is where we get to this lifecycle methodology. 
And then really what I translate back to some of our customer success leadership teams or some of the key stakeholders or executive vice presidents, we say, well, if we follow this racetrack methodology, we know it's going to get speed to value. We're, we're still protecting that production versus production capability. We're enabling transformation. So instead of teams working in silos, we feel like this racetrack helps teams work together. And then we also have a methodology on how we're going to scale through CS to make sure that we're touching and reaching every customer that we work with. Now, Hey, uh, Roger, sorry yeah. just to jump in here. We have yeah. one question um, from Amy. She's, she said speed to value is a huge metric uh, to scalability. Yeah. How is this value? How do you measure that? I know you, you brought, mentioned it a little bit, um, but in, any other thoughts on how to measure uh, speed to value? Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, so one of the things that we do from a CSM perspective is the, the day that a, that a customer buys a new product with us, and we'll talk a little bit more about it in the presentation, but just to address this question is we almost start tracking the time immediately. And the reason why I say that is because um, I know that there's specific teams and organizations that have a strong onboarding process, and that's something that we really try to drive at Cisco. Um, but we start tracking customers specifically to how long that they're staying in these specific stages. Now, the reason why I say that is because just because a customer gets through onboarding a little bit quicker, they may get stuck in that use stage of actually using the product. And so instead of waiting for a customer, for example, specifically that they'll be in that stage for 60 to 90 days, we want to make sure that we have actionable insights to say, what does a really holistic customer success journey look like for the customer within this product? So we give them some guidelines and specific um, you know, timetables to say, hey, if, we, if you want to start seeing value out of this product and you want to start excelling it among different organizations within your company, this is kind of the path that we like to follow. We want to make sure we have changes. And so I think that's a big thing just to make sure that we're, we're tracking not only how long the customer is staying there, but also have they added it as a success priority? So is this part of their success plan that we can go back to the customer to make sure that we're checking in on with them? And also, are we logging any active adoption barriers? So for example, a big adoption barrier for us is we may not have the right key contact. So the person that was provided a point of sale is a procurement person. They may not be the one that's actually the implementation owner. And so we start tracking things like that as adoption barriers as well. So we can go back to whether it's the sales teams or if maybe it's a product functionality, we go back to the product team. So we just want to make sure that no customer stays stuck and we're actively tracking that. So that's kind of how we do it. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about it in detail, but I hope that answers the question. Yeah, thank you. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and, and actually, this is a great slide to kind of uh, go a little bit deeper on that. Um, one of the things that we've gone back to the customer success teams, um, but also some of our other organizations is we want to make sure that we're creating strong interlocks and connections with some of our sales teams, our renewals teams, our product teams. And so this is an image that we actually created to really talk to them about what does a customer current path look like? Um, you can see that similar to sales, like obviously they have opportunities and pipeline that they really need to focus on, but we want to make sure that we start creating this like belief system that we called sell while you sleep, where we're really trying to address customers having this seamless journey with us. And one of the things that we proactively went to some of these collective teams is we said, Hey, if we're going to have our customers fail, we want them to fail fast, but we want them, we want to be able to know where they're going just so we can really feel like we're an advocate with them on this journey with them. And so this is why we created this infographic where we say a customer may spend a lot of time and value in making sure that they're really having this proof of concept, want to make sure that they're really investing in purchasing this product. But you can see that this is really some of the multiple layers or approaches or journeys that a customer will go through just to try to start seeing value out of the product that they purchased with us. And so you can see that they create a deployment plan, they spend money in training, they start working with their partners, they ran into an issue, they go back to a dependency plan, they need a feature that has this expertise that they need help on. And so when it comes to customer success and customer success operations, I talked to you a little bit about what the values look like from the organization, but we wanted to start creating some foundational pillars when it came to having a really strong alignment with some of these teams, which you can see on the left-hand side, but also having a carved out path on helping our customers reach that stage where they feel like they're optimizing the value that they've seen with the product. 
I know some teams have been familiar, but we, we, we've worked with teams on creating what we call a value framework, which is an acronym of making sure that we've validated why the customer bought the product. We're creating awareness within not only the customer that's using the product, but across all segments in the organization. Um, the L stands for learning. What resources do we have the customer to feel like successful in their journey with us? The U is utilization. How is the customer going to measure success? But the last one's in that, and I feel like it goes with this optimized stage where if the customer pulled out the technology tomorrow or the product, would they feel the impact on the business? And so that's where we start building these foundational pillars. And underneath that, you can see that we have some in customer success ops on how we build some of our functions around specific programs or motions or things that will execute in the customer success or sales field that will help us be successful in the customer success's journey with us, but also helping us build scale as well. And this is what it looks like from a Cisco perspective. And so you can see that we have specifically six foundational pillars. So when we're asked from whether it's renewals or sales or some of our leadership teams on specifically running a customer success motion or a new program around a product, we ask ourselves under what specific foundational pillar will this execute success on? I apologize. And you can see that it's really based off of a customer success's journey with us, similar to what we are trying to drive for our customers. So the first one is we look at align. Do we have a strong alignment with our customer success sales teams and also with the customer as well? So in that specific stage, we've created an align checklist where the sales team will actually be accountable to creating the point of contact, the business outcomes of why the customer purchased the, the product with us. And it actually automates and sends a specific CTA to the, uh, to the customer success team to make sure that they have a call to action now to really go ahead and engage with the customer. The second one is activation. No, to making sure that we have a strong onboarding experience with our customers to make sure that whether they're getting restarted on the journey with us or having an onboarding step, that's something that's very critical to us. The third one is adoption, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in the slide deck, but we want to make sure that our customers have a seamless process when it comes to customer success. So we want to make sure that we have specific taxonomies on how a customer success manager will engage with the customer. Is it digital journeys? Is it customer success tips? Is it ask the expert sessions or webinars like this one? Is it accelerators with so more to one-to-one -one journey as well? There's also an upgrade if a customer is on you know, more of an older version of software conformance. The, uh, the fifth one is scale, making sure that we have a full customer success motion that's driven by telemetry, digital triggers, exit criteria, and the last one's focusing on renewal as well. Now, I really like this slide because what does that specifically look like when it comes to customer success and building out that framework? So on the left-hand side, we start looking at our products. Now, just because our customers purchase a product, does it necessarily mean that they're eligible for a customer success journey? And the reason why I say that is what we establish at Cisco is something called hierarchy management platform. We want to make sure that before we engage with our customers, that they have the right, whether it's licensing, products, software, specific key components for their adoption journey with us. The reason why we build out the HMP is not that we don't want to support a customer, but we want to make sure that there's some accountability back to some of those other teams that we work with from an industry standpoint to make sure that they're accountable to say, hey, have we sold the customer the right product? Have we made sure that the customer is eligible for this journey with us? The second step is defining use cases around the product. Now, for example, somebody may buy a cell phone because they want to connect with their family. They want to make sure that they have text messages capabilities. I may buy, buy a cell phone just because I want to watch you know, Netflix or Hulu. But specifically, we're having different use cases of why I'm buying a cell phone. And so we want to start operationalizing that from a use case perspective for some of our products. We want to make sure that we're capturing some of the use cases of why the customers bought the product and start segmenting that as a use case to track in this framework. So you can see that we have some products that have three use cases. We have some products that have two use cases. So we differentiate a little bit on why we see the customer seeing value around it. Then we start working with an adoption engine or our customer success ops team or acceleration teams to start building out a program around it. We actually hire program leads that are specifically tailored around that product so they can actually host office hours. They can actually train the field to be more product experts to learn more about the product and the why around the product. And they start really start executing some of these motions and plays to the customer success field. 
And you can see these are some of the examples of why we'll run customer success plays in the specific field. So maybe the customer has an upcoming renewal. Maybe we're working with engineering to have a specific use case around it. Maybe it's a new pilot or campaign. Maybe there's a new capability in the product. Maybe the customer needs some in-product adoption help. And you can see that as we start segmenting that, we start creating routes to market on how that's going to be executed in the field. So sometimes we'll say, well, we're looking at, at customers that have a specific sp spend threshold with us. Maybe they have an upcoming renewal in the next 12 to 18 months. Maybe this customer is a very influential customer. They have an executive sponsor. And so we'll start really identifying some of those route to markets on how we start building that motion to really build that power scale to have customers being able to be reached out to, but also making sure that we're not leaving any customer left behind. Now, I know I'm running a little bit low on time, but I'll talk a little bit about what that looks like. Um, the reason why I bring up this slide is we want to make sure that every product that we have or every use case that we have, we have at least 21 taxonomies or assets for a customer success manager to execute with their customer. So they may have a webinar, which is an Ask the Expert session. Maybe it's a precision engagement where we can work directly one-on-one -on -one with the customer where it's more of a hand-holding approach. Maybe it's an accelerator. We want them to get to a specific checkpoint that we're gonna help them do that together. Um, and you can see that you know through this session, and if you want a detailed approach on this, feel free to reach out to me, but we, we like to distinguish what that looks like. So customers have more of a, a perspective or approach on what their journey specifically looks like. But the nice thing is if I go back to this checkpoint perspective, you can see on the left-hand side that as a customer moves through this racetrack with us, that we have those taxonomies for customer success to use so that they feel like they're not stuck in helping the customer out, that they feel like they have this roadmap so they can say, oh, this customer specifically in onboarding, I'm gonna go ahead and do a session around an overview planning or getting started with us. Or hey, this customer is more in an engaged stage. Well, we can do a health check with the customer just to make sure that they're seeing the full value out of the technology with us. And you can see that as we start mapping this out, we, we start, also initiating some of the roles around it to say that there's really success around everybody that gets involved with some of these accounts. Again, this is kind of what our approach on what success plays look like. So when we start running these motions, we start creating calls to actions in the CSP. And this is what it looks like from a routing perspective. And then you can kind of see how we start building the framework as well. Um, I'll skip past this. It, it's a great video. It, it starts about how customer success starts building the story at Cisco. Um, actually, you know, I'll play a little bit of it just because I think it's really cool because what we've started to do is not only are we building the story with our customers to show value out of what they're getting with us, but we're also showing it with some of our um, key stakeholders that work with us. And so this is what we built from a customer success ops perspective. I'll play a really quick snippet of it. Roger, I'm not sure we're hearing the 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 voice. Oh, um, the can sound. you hear it? Or is the, the volume coming through? The sound's not coming through, unfortunately. Ah, okay, okay. Not not a problem, not a problem. Um, I'll just sorry, I'll just go to so let me exit out of this. Sorry, one second. Let me let me go ahead and exit out because it's not okay. There we go. Um, okay. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, I can share the video after, and then I'll just finish on this last point. Um, so one of the things that um we're really trying to invest time in is through customer success is really building a story around our customers and what's relevant to them. So I know at the beginning of this presentation, I talked to you a little bit about that customers are necessarily really getting more interested in identifying what customers are doing in their demographic or vertical, understanding like, what is something that I'm possibly missing with my technology? And so I created this slide called Moments That Matter. So you can see that these are some of the characteristics of these specific people on this slide. So you can see that we have Prince Charles, who was born in 1948, raised in the UK. We have Tom Cruise. We also have Stephen Colbert, 
But if I go to this next slide, it's still the same characteristics, but it's completely different people. You see that you have Ozzy Osbourne. Um, you also have SpongeBob on the far right hand side. You have Johnny Knoxville. And so sometimes when you start segmenting your customers by specific attributes, it may not be what's relevant for the customer on their end or perspective as well. And so that's something that I say, it shouldn't just be about demographics. And the last thing that I'll show actually is, I'm actually gonna come out of the slide, but that's something that we're trying to do at Cisco as well. So this is actually an ebook that we created from our customer success ops perspective. And we're actually calling something called success tracks on how do we measure success for a customer but this is actually a portal that a customer can log into. And if this was a healthcare customer, they can start identifying some of their specific KPIs on what's relevant and important to them. So you can start seeing that we're starting to map some of these specific KPIs back to the customer, but also using AI capability to tell our customers, hey, you may be missing out on turning on this key feature on this key program that you're not doing specifically through the product. So you can start seeing that they're seeing some of these KPIs on what they need to do actively with the product. And the nice thing is then they start having some assets and resources on, hey, this is actually a customer success story that we have through healthcare vertical. Um, this is what happened in overcoming positioning challenges. This is how they resolve some of those challenges by success tracks. What was key to success for this engagement? Um, you can see that there's an elevator pitch a little bit more about customer success. Um, and then you have specific calls to actions for the customer to be able to be successful in their journey with us. So the thing that we're really trying to do is we're trying to make sure that our customers are successful with us, that they're seeing value through some of their taxonomies, what they've purchased with us. And so out of this presentation, I think the four, th four things that I really want to address that you take away with is the, the top one is building out a framework. So making sure that you have that customer success strategy, building that story you may not have something with you today, and that's okay. There's actually a book that I love. It's called The Oz Principle, and it's all around the characters of the Wizard of Oz. And they say, the book is about really every person that was going to Oz, they were looking for something that they already had. So the lion wanted courage, the tin man wanted a heart, but it was through their experiences that built them what they wanted. And so that's why I think about customer success ops. It's building that story. You may not have a customer success ops function, but you may have the characteristics to start building out that story. The bottom left-hand side is that operating model excellence. So start building out that journey of what that specifically looks like. How do you want to get measured to success? The top right-hand one is moments that matter. And that's really relating back to customer. What are those specific moments or key checkpoints that's going to matter back to the customer? And the last one is measuring impact. How can you go back to your other organizations that you work with to show that there is really impact in customer success? So with that being said, um, I will end the presentation there. But I'm happy to field any questions or comments, um, but really appreciated the time today. That's that's great stuff, Roger. Really appreciate it. Um, so if anybody has any questions as we end, feel free to drop them in the Q and A, and we'll answer them. Roger, I got two that I'll just I'll just ask as we uh, close out. If you were if if you were to um, if you were to figure out like where as a CS ops person you should spend your time collaborating with functional leaders around you, where would you spend your time as far as like building alignment and, and those types of things for your strategy and program? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So uh, one of the things that I think that's super valuable is like really creating a strong interlock with the program team that's in charge of product development and building out the product. Yeah. And the reason why I say that is I try to have a continual cadence with them every two to three weeks where we start mapping our customers based off renewal probability. But then we start collecting some of those adoption barriers. We start looking at customers that have an upcoming renewal in that next fiscal year. And so they feel like they're a part of this journey with us. And so one of the things that I've been sharing with one of our product development teams is I'm like, hey, I want some gamification in the product. Like what's going to make a customer start coming back to the product, see value out of it? And they're like, hey, that's really a great idea. We, we, we noticed that we can start working together hand in hand. We, we start representing the customer as a voice of the customer. So we feel like if you start working with that team specifically, create some slide decks that you can kind of come back to to be like, hey, this is what we're going to do from a tactical perspective. But these are some of the goals that we have for this upcoming year. I think you can see a lot of value out of that. I love that. I think a lot of times we think naturally of the sales team or, or, or others. 
And um, at the end of the day, in SaaS companies, it's all revolves around the product. Um, and so having a great alignment with the product team, making sure they understand the use cases really well, and they're building and shipping according to the to the customer's uh, use cases is, is super, super um, important. All right, the other question I'd have is like, if you were to, what do you think is, the, um, if you were to name one skill that is that is the magic power of a CS ops uh, um, leader or, or professional, what would be the skill? Ooh, I love that question, Dave. I yeah. would say, um, so I, I tie it back to, so I actually recently did a graduate certificate program through Cornell, which was on AI strategy. Um, cool. And actually it, it goes kind of what you talked about in the CS summit with that 5.0 of customer success. Yeah. But um, one of the things that I really liked about it is that, that they were actually having a live discussion about it. They, they said that even though AI is fantastic, I go back to that Marvel analogy where Tony Stark was talking to Spider-Man and he said, well, if you're nothing without the suit, then you don't deserve the suit. So if you look back on it, if you're nothing without connecting data and teams, you're really not ready for AI. And the reason why I say that is because they, they say that AI really can't replicate what creates high performing teams. Like you can go to a high performing team and say like, what makes you guys so efficient? And they may say, well, it's connection or it's chemistry, but they really can't replicate that. And so I say the skill that you should develop is connecting the pieces and being able to build that story together. So to say, hey, if I start talking about customer success ops, the skill that I'm going to really talk about is how do I connect all these organizations as one, bring them all together in a room and be able to start connecting them to say, hey, like you guys need to start talking together. Because I see this all the time on the customer side where I'll say, hey, are you using this product? You know, you can integrate it with this other product at Cisco that we have. And they're like, oh yeah, we don't talk to those security team folks. Like we need to get connected with them. So I think being able to connect those pieces would be a skill that I highly recommend. I love that. Uh, so, so many times we kind of build our strategy in a silo. Yep. We re recognize that it takes a team. It takes that connected team, that connected tissue across the organization to really execute. And uh, as you said, the better you do that, the better um, that the, everybody will execute. So yeah. good answer. I love it. All right, Roger. Hey, it looks like uh, no more questions today. So grateful you could join us. Uh, super interesting insights and recommendations and best practices to build your strategy to scale. Thanks for thanks for coming on today. Any Any last comments? No, no, I'd say, um, honestly, like I, I, I appreciate the time. I know, um, you know, just working with you, Dave and your team, you guys have been phenomenal and fantastic. So huge shout out to client success, but team, if there's anything in the presentation where you're like, Hey, that resonates with me or, Hey, I want to hear more about like, feel free to look me up on LinkedIn. We can set up some time to chat. Happy to be a resource to you. Great. Thanks again, Roger. Uh, appreciate having you on. Looking forward to, to continuing to collaborate and thanks to everybody else for joining. We're, we're grateful for, uh, for everybody joining us today. We hope that uh, this was a valuable use of your time. Again, we uh, wanna thank you from the team at Client Success. Uh, please reach out if we can help it, it, it at all in anything that, as you build and scale your customer success strategy. Now, this is an all, next week we've got another webinar we're, we're very excited about. We've got uh, Todd Kirk and Casey Trujillo from Brainstorm who will talk about scaling their, uh, their your digital playbooks. So we encourage you to sign up for that. I think registration links are in the chat, um, but between now and then, uh, thanks and have a great week. Reach out to us. Uh, again, this is Dave Blake, founder and CEO of Client Success, signing off for this week. We'll see you next week. Thanks everybody.